Uh, if you brought your Bibles, uh, let's preach a sermon and let's do it in, in Psalm 119. We'll start in Psalm 119. And as you're finding Psalm 119, I think as your pastor, it might be wise if I would share with you just a little bit uh, about something that, that, that is, that's going on. Uh, have you heard there's an uh, election took place this week? You heard about that? And, and here's, here's why I think it might be helpful to, for some of you just to get this perspective. Uh, Joe Biden is, uh, has been by the media proclaimed as the next president. I watched uh, the speech he gave yesterday. I watched every word. But at the same time, uh, President Trump is saying that, that it's not legitimate, that there are recounts that have to take place first, that there was voter fraud, illegal votes were counted. Uh, you have people on both sides of the aisle. You have Senate majority leaders weighing in saying, you know, wait, wait, wait. Uh, maybe Donald Trump has been reelected. Who's, who, who, who's the next president? And you, you were wondering the same thing when you woke up on Wednesday morning. And so here, here's what I would like to say. We may not know with 100% certainty who will be in the White House, but we do know who is on the throne. Our God is still on his throne. He is still in control. He is sovereign. He rules and he reigns. You can't overthrow him. You can't usurp him. You can't vote him out. You can't go to court for a second opinion because he is the judge and there is no jury. Now, you, you may not have known who was going to be sitting in the White House on Tuesday, but you definitely know who is sitting on the throne and God is still in control and nothing is ever going to change that. You may have gone to bed on Tuesday wondering, wondering uh, who's the next president, I don't know. But I can promise you this, when you go to bed every night, when you wake up in the morning, I can guarantee you that God is still going to be on his throne. He is still going to be in control. And that comforts me when it feels like all the time these days, our world is spinning out of control. It comforts me to know that my God is still in control. And in the wee hours of the night on November the 4th, I don't think God was in heaven biting his fingernails down to the nub. The Holy Trinity did not meet in emergency session. Why? Because God is not depending on the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. God does not ride the backs of donkeys or elephants. He is God, and beside him there is no other. Earthly kings matter. Earthly presidents matter, but there is a king of kings and a lord of lords, and that matters more. And I know him personally, and he lives in my heart, and so I'm here to tell you everything's going to be all right. It is. I've, now, I've voted. I care a lot. I, I stayed up late Tuesday night to see what would happen, but for quite a while now, I can tell you, I've not been depending on Washington, D.C. to fix the problems that face our country. I'm not looking to the White House to fix the problems that face our country. I'm not looking to the Democratic House of Representatives to fix the problems that face our country. I'm not looking to the Republican Senate to fix the problems that fix our country. I'm not looking to the Supreme Court. I am looking to Almighty God because God and God alone is the only one who can heal our land because our problems are spiritual and the only one who can deal with the spiritual problem is the Lord Jesus Christ. America needs revival. America needs to come back to God. So, so, so really, really, it doesn't matter who's in the White House as long as Jesus is the Lord of your house. I've never seen voter turnout like this, have you? Willowbrook, if you don't know, is a polling place. And I've been your pastor 19 and a half years, so I have seen a few elections, and I've never seen anything quite like this. Uh, early Tuesday morning, I... I'm looking in the parking lot. I'm like, we don't get this many cars on a Sunday. And look, I took a picture. Look at the line. This is our church. The line goes out the door, down the sidewalk, across the parking lot, out to the street. The line to vote. And I was late to my own staff meeting because I was just standing there looking at this line. And all I could think of was this. America will not be whole until people start lining up like that to go to church on Sunday morning. Have you ever seen people line up like that to go to church and worship God? I've, I haven't. 
I've, no, I take it back. I've seen it in, in Mombasa, Kenya. I saw people lined up for miles to go to church. And guess what? When I preached and gave an invitation, 144 people were saved. Yeah, I've seen it in Africa. I want to see it in America. When we start lining up to come to church the way people line up to vote, when we start caring about God as much as we care about a presidential election, then we will have peace. Then we will have healing. Then God will restore our land. But thus saith the Lord, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. Then will I forgive their sins. Then will I heal their land. Second Chronicles 7, 14. And that's what we need. So I just wanted to tell you, let not your hearts be troubled. It's okay. Our God is still in office. No one dare try to kick him out. The devil tried once and then you saw what happened to him. He's got a lake of fire waiting for him. No matter how out of control things may seem when you watch the news, just remember, just remember that your God is still in control. Your God is still on his throne. He's got this and he's got you. So with that introduction, uh, uh, let me try to tie that into our, our sermon today. There's going to be a lot of debate in the coming weeks, as you know, on can you trust the results of the election? And similarly, over the, the centuries, there's been a lot of debate on whether or not you can trust the Bible. If you were here uh, last week, I preached a sermon where I gave you evidence on the trustworthiness of Scripture. And as often is the case, I did not finish and I promised you that, that I would finish today. I told you I'll, I'll, I'll give you more uh, evidence that the Bible you hold in your lap that you brought to church is a Bible that you can, can trust. If you missed the first sermon, it's bestsellers. It's online, or bestseller. Today would be part two. We are going to look at more evidence. Uh, in Psalm 119, we're going to read some verses from the Bible about the Bible and then we'll jump into the evidence. Let me say this about Psalm 119. Uh, the author of this psalm loved the word of God. This psalm is all about the Bible. He, he uses eight different words to describe scripture. And I'll just tell you that there's no possible way I could teach you the entire psalm. There, there are 176 verses. In Psalm 119, it's the longest of all the Psalms. If I just spent one minute on each verse, it would take me three hours to preach Psalm 119. So I'm just going to give you a taste, just an appetizer. But I hope this taste will make you hungry to read more, go home, read the whole thing. Uh, Psalm 119 is an amazing uh, chapter in your Bible. The Psalm is an acrostic. There are eight lines in each section, and each section follows the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. The, the first eight verses, for instance, each, each verse begins with the Hebrew letter Aleph. That, that would be like A, Aleph. And then verses 9 to 16 each start with the next Hebrew letter, Bet. Verses 17 to 24 begin with the next letter in the Hebrew alphabet, Gemel. And this continues successively for the next 176 verses. It's very poetic. It goes through the Hebrew alphabet. So let's begin reading Psalm 119, starting in verse 1. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Notice all of the different words he used to describe the Bible. He uses the word decrees, precepts, statutes, the law of the Lord. And I like in verses one and two how both verses start with the word blessed. Blessed are those who walk according to the law of the Lord. Verse two, blessed are those who keep his statutes. If you want to have a blessed life, then you need to read this book, study this book, live your life based on the principles of this book. Blessed is the person who will do that. And, and now we skip over to, mm, skip over to verse nine. Starting in verse nine, we're in the second section, each verse starting with the Hebrew letter bet. 
Verse 9, how can a young man stay on the path of purity? Well, here's the answer. By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Oh, there's power in the word of God. You want to resist temptation? When temptation comes, uh, verse 11 says, hide God's word in your heart. If the truth is in your heart, you'll be able to combat Satan's lies. You'll be victorious. You want to be pure? Verse 9, he says, live according to the word of God. Keep reading. Verse 12. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips, I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. You see this phrase repeatedly in Psalm 119, the phrase delight. He says, verse 16, I delight in your decrees. Look at verse 24. He says, your statutes are my delight. Do you delight in the word of God? Or you just keep a copy to put on your coffee table and make it look like you're holy? Do do you love the Bible? Do, Do you love it, delight in it? Or do you neglect it? In verse 16, he says, I will not neglect your word. And so now, as promised, I want to finish giving you evidence that the Bible is trustworthy. Shared a lot last week, and I had some of you tell me that you have agnostic friends, and it's very helpful as you talk to your uh, friends who are skeptical of our faith. And so hopefully this this information will help you as well uh, as, as you as you listen to the message. So by way of review, last week, number one, we talked about scientific evidence. Scientific evidence, that was last week. Number two, literary evidence. I spent a long time on that last week talking about the New Testament manuscript evidence, but we did not look at the Old Testament. Let me just give you a little bit. Uh, Talking about the Old Testament, for centuries, critics of the Bible complained that the Old Testament text was not reliable. Then in 1947, there was a shepherd boy who lived near the Dead Sea. One of his goats had wandered off and he was looking for the goat. So he bent bent down, picked up a rock and threw it in a cave. He's thinking, well, maybe maybe the goat's in the cave. I'll hit the goat, it'll come out. But when he threw the rock, he heard a jar break. That was curious. So he climbed into the cave to investigate. And when he did, he discovered the cave was full of jars, and inside the jars were ancient scrolls. Well, what happened was he had just discovered what we now call the Dead Sea Scrolls, over 800 ancient manuscripts of every book in the Old Testament except the book of Esther. And, and these manuscripts are so much older, so much closer to the time that they were written. Oh, I wonder if it'll match up with the Old Testament that we already had. And yes, word for for word. I'll show you a picture. Uh, there's a picture of me and Jan when we were in Israel, and there's a, we're in Qumran. That's where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's one of the caves where they found some of the scrolls. I've actually hiked up into some of these caves uh, just because I like doing that sort of thing. And maybe one day we'll go to Israel again if the pandemic ever comes to an end, and I will take you there, and you'll be able to see it for yourself. Here's what's amazing. Before the Dead Sea Scrolls, The oldest manuscript that we had of Isaiah dated 900 A.D., 900 A.D. But in the caves, there is one jar with a complete scroll of the book of Isaiah that dated to 200 B.C. In one discovery, textual evidence for the Old Testament jumped back over a thousand years. I'm telling you, no other ancient book in the world has the literary integrity of the Bible. So scientific evidence, we've had literary evidence. Number three, let's spend a little bit of time talking about prophetic evidence, prophetic evidence. I love the story about the businesswoman who was on a crowded plane flying home and she pulled out her Bible, put it on the tray table and started to read. The man sitting next to her said, really? Do do you, you really believe What's in that book? She said, oh, as a matter of fact, yes, I believe every word. Oh, no, that's just a bunch of fairy tales, kind of like the story about that guy that got swallowed up by a whale. What was his name? The lady said, "Uh, his name was Jonah. And yes, I believe that story as well. I believe he was swallowed by a great fish and he survived and lived to tell about it. 
<laughs> the man said, are you kidding? Tell me how in the world could someone get swallowed by a fish and live to tell about it? She said, I, I don't know. I guess when I get to heaven, I'll just ask him. He said, well, what if Jonah's not in heaven? Without missing a beat, she said, then you can ask him. <laughs> and he didn't bother her anymore for the rest of the flight. I hope the evidence I'm sharing with you will help as you may have similar conversations with some of your, your skeptical friends. And maybe, maybe you're an agnostic uh, and you're, you've tuned in today because you have a friend that asked you to tune in. I hope this helps you as well. Uh, the, the evidence we have from prophecy is so very convincing. In the Old Testament, there are over 2,000 predictive prophecies. Islam has zero. Buddhism, there are none. But in the Bible, there are over 2,000 predictive prophecies, and here's the deal. They're specific, and they are detailed. Modern-day, self-proclaimed prophets, typically, if they make a prediction, it's very vague and very general, kind of like opening a fortune cookie. You're going to travel. You're going to meet a tall man. <laughs> it's very vague, but not in the Bible. It's very specific. There are names of people and places and dates, and also in the Bible, the standard is 100% accuracy. Example, Deuteronomy 18, verse 22 says, if a prophet's word does not come true, then the Lord has not spoken and he is not a prophet. That means if just one of these 2,000 Old Testament prophecies does not come true, then none of the Bible is true. You have to be accurate 100% of the time. So, so let's see, does the Bible pass the test? Obviously, we don't have time to study 2,000 prophecies, but let's, let's look at a few, just a few examples of fulfilled prophecies. Number one, Cyrus rebuilding the temple. Cyrus rebuilding the temple. The year was 700 BC. Isaiah in 700 BC predicted that a king by the name of Cyrus would say this, Jerusalem will be rebuilt and the temple foundations will be laid. Now, what made that unusual is that at the time uh, Isaiah wrote it, Jerusalem was fully built and the temple was still standing. Let's read the prophecy together. Isaiah 44, verse 28. Who says of Cyrus, there's the name, he will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt and of the temple, let its foundations be laid. So Isaiah predicted that a man by the name of Cyrus, who would not be born for another hundred years, would command to rebuild a temple that was still standing when he made the prediction. Ah, but a hundred years later, the city of Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem were destroyed by a Babylonian king named Nebuchadnezzar in the year 586 BC. But then the Babylonians were conquered by the Persians in the year 539 BC, and the Persians had an emperor, guess what his name was? Cyrus. And Cyrus issued a decree to rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And it all happened 160 years after the prophecy of Isaiah. Fascinating, right? How about another? Uh, number two, let's look at the destruction of Tyre. Uh, now, Tyre was a powerful, prosperous city on the Mediterranean. What makes this prophecy amazing is that the, the prophecy of its destruction was made at the height of Tyre's power. Here's the prophecy. Read with me in Ezekiel 16, verse 4. It's on the screen. They will destroy the walls of Tyre and pull down her towers. I will scrape away her rubble and make her a bare rock. So not only was the prophecy that Tyre would be destroyed, but the prophecy was that it would be wiped clean, the debris would be scraped off until the city looked like the top of a bare rock. How would it happen? Look at verse 12 in Ezekiel 16. They will plunder your wealth and loot your merchandise. They will break down your walls and demolish your fine houses and throw your stones, timber, and rubble into the sea. So the prophecy is this. City will be destroyed. It'll be scraped clean so it looks smooth like the top of a bare rock. And we just read the timbers, the stones, the debris from the city would be thrown into the sea. How was it fulfilled? Well, a few years later, 
Nebuchadnezzar, who we just talked about, of Babylon. He brought an army and he laid siege to the city of Tyre. Beginning in 585 BC and for the next 13 years, they attacked until finally the city crumbled. The Babylonian army rushed into the city, destroyed it, but some of the people from Tyre survived and those who survived actually fled into the sea by boat. They went offshore and they found an island that was just about a half a 